This weekend on the original Rochester Press Box. Hi, I'm Jody Gage of the Rochester Americans and Rochester Nighthawks. We're going to be talking about kids playing multiple sports. And I'm John Dottilio. I'll tell you who I think the NFL MVP should be. And I'm Mike Catalana. I'll tell you a story about a guy in the NFL who talks about what it's worth to sacrifice to live out his dream. I'm Bill Pucko on Deconstructing Ted Nolan. Join us this weekend on the original Rochester Press Box. Hello everyone and welcome to the original Rochester Press Box. I'm Bill Pucko, joined as always by John DiTullio, Fox 1280 Sports. Good to be with you, Billy. Oh, yes. right, I got the whole thing out. Mike Catalana, 13 yeah. Wham News, Sports Director. Good to be back. And I want to get this right, the Director of Strategic Planning now. You've held many titles for the Rochester Americans, of course, the great Jody Gage. Pleasure to have you join us finally here in the Rochester well, Press Box. Well, it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> with such uh, <laughs> yeah, sports okay. guys here. You're, you're at the Hall of Fame. Yeah. The only one you need to get here is Mr. Funky, and then we've got the whole team. Senator Funky. Yes. Well, sorry. <laughs> sorry. There you go. Jody, we want to talk about the Buffalo Sabres. It's been an odd year for them to start. And Ted Dolan's right in the middle of it, a guy uh, you know very well. Are you surprised by the success he's having with this team? Yes and no. When you, when you look at the talent level, you know, you, you could see why they struggled. But, uh, you know, playing with Teddy and, you know, living with him, you know, we, we grew up in Adirondack, and he is such the ultimate team guy as a player fought for his teammates and uh, he's one of those guys that uh, you know he's got there's certain people when you're around them they just give off this aurora and he does that he makes his players compete at a higher level and they don't have the talent like the other teams but he's got them playing and they're competing and uh, now they believe and that's that's the key when your players start believing that they can win you're seeing the results right now. I think they're the hottest team in the National Hockey League right now. Yeah, how funny it is that, you know, with, a, again, your background, having played together back in the 80s here at the Rochester Americans, I mean, did, did you swap war stories or something or figure, you know, someday in the future these kind of things are going to happen, I'm going to be a coach, you're going to be an executive? Well, you know, you, you never know that as a player, but uh, it's amazing. A lot of the you – know, Bill Deneen was one of our head coaches, and, and if you go off those teams – there's a lot of players that are involved in the game of hockey, Barry Melrose, Kenny Hall, and, uh, you know, so a reflection of Bill, but also Teddy wasn't the most talented hockey player, but uh, he had an ability, always picking my brain to get better. Mel Davis, who was a highly skilled player for the Amherst, uh, the three of us were very close, and he was one of those guys who was a student of the game, loved the game, and his passion just comes out. And, uh, you know, now he's a teacher of the game. And, uh, you know, he's not, just like Bill was not the greatest at X and O's. I don't think Teddy's will say he's the be uh, great at X and O's. But uh, he surrounds himself with quality people. And uh, you just want to go through the wall for him. You know, and even as a teammate, you know, he had your back and you always wanted to have Teddy back. And it's great to see him have the success that he's having. The guys are screwing up the plan. <laughs> well, he's won. I mean, he won with the Sabres his first go around. He took the Islanders to the playoffs. The guy is just a winner, and it's always about fits. And Jody knows this. He's the perfect fit for this team. I wouldn't want anybody else to coach this team. If Pat LaFontaine did anything right in his brief tenure with the Sabres, he hired Ted Nolan. And it's exciting to watch this team that probably shouldn't have 13 wins. Well, let's face it, on paper, they're not that talented as a team, but yet you see a lot of the young players that are the future of the Sabres, and Nolan doing what he does best, as Jody mentions, maximizes, gets the best out of those players. I think it's exciting. Can we, I go back to my weekly thought mm -hmm. about tanking? And, you know, everybody, in, in mm -hmm. a general sense, it, again, it is the benefit of losing, which is a high draft pick, but not to those guys on the ice or on the court. Yeah. They want to win. They want to play hard. And they had no success early. And he kept driving into them. We got to do better. I need more effort. I need this and that. And then all of a sudden, they have a little success. And they seem like a different team. I remember at the beginning of the year, they, they couldn't get shots on goal. I mean, they, it was pitiful. People were saying, how can NBC Sports ever even show them on that national <laughs> game of the week? It's embarrassing. And they've won, I think, three of the last four times they've been on there. They've been an exciting team to watch, too. They're so much different. And it comes from coaching and believing in the guys, and then the guys believing 
Why not us? Why not us win in some games? I think it's impressive. Just quickly, Jody, are, are we possibly missing something with this team? Well, John says they're obviously not that good on paper. I mean, is there a chance that this is a good hockey team? You know, first of all, all players to be at that level are good. That's not the issue. Do they have the talent the other teams? Uh, no, they don't. However, the one thing that Teddy, it's his favorite word, he uses it over and over, and it's the way he played, is compete. You know, and if, once you compete, you start working hard, other things start happening. Now they're playing, like I'm watching some of the goals, they're playing with a high confidence and skill level that you didn't see at the beginning. And uh, I think the whole thing, and you know, it's, it's an old saying, if you're in a slump, how do you get out of a slump? Just work hard. Mm -hmm. Things will start happening, and you know, that's what's happening with the Buffalo Sabres. I hesitate to say that we hope it might continue. The Buffalo Bills are playing at Oakland. We'll look at the NFL next. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box. Bill Pucka with uh, Mike and Jody and John. Football. Uh, Buffalo's playing at Oakland this week, coming off maybe their biggest win, I don't know, close to a decade. Yeah. Uh, how do you see this one going? I, I think defense travels, and that's why I feel good about them going on the road for this. Uh, you know, their offense is what it is, but they are going up against a rookie quarterback and what they've faced the last two weeks. And a lot of teams you would worry a little bit about a letdown and all. This team isn't good enough to have letdowns. They know what's in front of them. And that defense plays. What I like about that defense is we keep asking them, aren't you getting frustrated with the offense? Aren't you worried about it? Yeah, I'm sure to some extent they are. But they have almost taken it upon themselves to say, we don't care. We're going to go win the game. And I think that'll travel to Oakland. I think they'll play that way. And I think they'll do well. And I wish I would have had the guts to pick them last week because John and I know we talked about it. Was, you knew the Packers were in trouble in that game. Yep. But I think even any of us would have thought the defense yep. would have dominated the Packers' offense, well, certainly in the passing game the way they did. And I think this defense is that good, and I think they'll travel well, and I think they'll yep. win the game handily. I think it's going to be one of those 24-7, to 24-10 games. I would think it would be a trap game if it was October. Yeah. But we're in late December. It's a playoff game. It's a playoff game, and the formula is, it's Mike, defense, special teams, don't, don't mess it up. Don't right? mess it up. They're going to have to make some plays. They don't need to make a lot of plays because they are playing the Raiders. I know uh, Derek Carr I like, but unless they get stupid with the football, the Bills, they'll win this game, and I think they'll win by at least 10 points. Their defense, as Mike mentioned, it's an elite defense. It's a smothering defense. Special teams also come up big today. You going with the guy who signs your checks? <laughs> well, absolutely. Yep. Uh, I definitely go with the Bills. But, you know, I've been in these type of games, and the only thing that scares you about these games is the pressure's on the Buffalo Bills. They have to win. There is no pressure on Oakland. So the key when we always played in these type of games was your start. You have to come out and start early. You know, put them away early. Show them that there's no chance they have, have to be in the game and don't yeah. give them any light because as the game goes on, because the team doesn't have pressure, the, it works against Buffalo. If they keep them close, the pressure starts building. Mm -hmm. And then when pressure builds, you start doing things, and start they making can't mistakes. they play from behind. They can't. The and yeah, definitely. So their defense has got to keep them in ball games. But I still think that uh, when you're this close to the end of the year, they've got a lot more to play for. I picked the Bills. Yeah, and the Raiders, two wins, right? San Francisco, it's a huge rivalry, regional rivalry in Kansas, in Kansas yeah. City on that Thursday night. When they've been bad, 
they've been really, really bad. And I like Carr, too. I think he's good, has yeah. a chance to be a pretty good player, but I think they'll get after him today. Yeah, I'm buying into the trap theory. I'm the only one here. I think between New England and between Green Bay, and everybody's talking about New England, no one's talking about Oakland, I think it's a bad spot to go out onto the road where the Raiders have won their last two games. So I'm taking the, the five and a half points of the Raiders. I see it 17-16 Buffalo. Buzz Give me a second game. <laughs> I know. That's the, only, <laughs> that's the one reason I'm picking them on the, on the winning side. I don't want to be a total buzzkill. <laughs> Uh, my second game I'm definitely going to take is it Denver Cincinnati. Uh, the reason I like the game, Manning is by far my favorite uh, football player. I just love the way that uh, he quarterbacks, and and I think it's preparation. I don't think anybody works any harder than him at football, and I just love watching him. And the second reason is. Uh, Buffalo needs Cincinnati to lose, so I'm going to take Denver. <laughs> All right, Denver's getting the points on Monday night. What do you got, Mike? I'm going with his Green Bay Packers <laughs> this week. It's a good week. pick this week. <laughs> on the road yep. against Tampa. Normally, again, this would be one of those late-season games that got Detroit the next week. They were embarrassed yeah. playing the way they did against the Bills. As good as the defense is, the offense made so many mistakes. Jordy Nelson dropped a 95-yard touchdown. I mean, he should have had it. And, and Rodgers, he doesn't play that way often at all, let alone twice in a row. I think they have way too much offense for Tampa Bay. I think they win that one going away. Giving 10 and a half to home team. A lot. It's a big number. John. Steelers at home, minus three. I think the Chiefs are tailor-made for the Steelers. They don't throw the ball downfield. The Steelers can make big plays. No Eric Berry in the back end. I think the Steelers and their big plays at home against a team that can't stretch the field, Steelers win that game cover easy today. I like, uh, I like Arizona playing home to Seattle, getting eight points. We're a team with the, what are they, right? Still the best record in the NFC is getting eight at home. They just cannot score. I, they I, make the Bills' yeah. offense look <laughs> like the old San Diego Does. Chargers, for gosh sakes. But that's, mean, that's a pretty amazing line. The, yeah. crew is, uh, the crew is rolling with the Bills, minus five and a half, and their outside pick is taking the Ravens minus four and a half against the Texans, who might start our old friend Thad Lewis in that game. Wow. <laughs> so those are our picks. We have Like It or Not when we return. This segment of the Rochester Press Box is brought to you by The Distillery. Four convenient locations, The Distillery, your choice destination for Sunday brunch with great food and drink specials, plus all of the games. The Distillery, a Best of Rochester award winner, tap into good times at The Distillery. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box, this segment of the Press Box, brought to you by our friends at The Distillery. Uh, brunch, or by the way, you can go, uh, you can join the Eagles Nest uh, right through the playoffs. I the hope so. <laughs> the Philadelphia Eagles fan club gathers at the distillery. Yeah. You get half priced uh, margaritas all the time and half priced Bloody Marys, my favorite for that brunch, which starts at 11 and goes for as long as the football games last. Love the people at the distillery. John, like it or not, setting the bar so low for A Rod. You know, the Yankees have bottomless pits, right? Why don't they just release him? Write him a check for 60 some million dollars and say, get the heck out of here. What is Brian Cashman doing? Well, he, I think Cashman wants to get rid of him, but I think Hank and Howe are so cheap, they don't want to write the check to write him off. Now, D.A., sure, he's going to be 40 years old, correct? Mm -hmm. What, are they hoping he's going to hit 19 to 20 home runs? Well, really? Cashman is like, it's, again, set my <coughs> soul well, I don't expect anything from the guy, he says. How about it? I don't even expect him to be at camp in February. He's going to be a circus. How does he help that team? I'm with John 100%. I was thinking this when oh. we talked about it as a subject. As a player, you know, again, will he give you something? I Maybe as a DH, but he is a distraction. Yeah. You have a franchise that is in transition. I mean, I really think they are. They're not good right now depending on what they do. They need to start building things back up a little bit. He comes in. You know, there are guys that are worth the headache. We know he's not <laughs> worth know. the headache. He isn't going to do enough for him. It's like the T.O. theory. Yeah. Once T.O. became not the player that he was, do you want him on your roster? No. I would say write him the check, say goodbye, because they're going to end up paying him anyhow. Is there one executive on the panel? Uh, <laughs> having a guy, you know, who, who has a negative aura like A-Rod does, how bad's it got to be just to let him go? Negative, I call it cancer. Yeah. When you have cancer, you got to cut it out, you got to let it go. And, you, you, you know, you're talking about if you're rebuilding, like the Yankees, 
are saying they're rebuilding. That means you got young players coming in. You can't have cancer around because it's going to affect your real rebuilding process. Sometimes you just got to cut your losses and move on, and I agree with John. All righty. Uh, Michael, like it or not, Jim Beheim kind of trashes his own team. Look, I went <laughs> off on a bit of a rant last week, and I think it's okay <laughs> for him to get after his players. But, you know, maybe he just says it publicly for us. But he says things like, um, you know, well, if we don't make shots, we're not going to win. <laughs> and if we don't guard the guy, he's going to make the shot. Now, I think, obviously, Jim Beheim knows the game isn't that simple. Yeah. But if it really is, then what are you doing? I, I, I keep going back to this. I want to see some coaching out of him. I don't expect him to baby the players, but I want to see some coaching. I don't see it. I don't know what he does for this team right now. This is not a great Syracuse team. I don't know if anybody yeah. thinks that way, but I want to see a little, I don't know if we'll ever say it, a little encouragement, a little of something. It's not like this is a massively talented team that is underperforming. This is what he has on this team now, and I think this is when you talk about, like Ted Nolan, you talk about coaching and making more out of your team. I don't think he's given his team And yet Nolan of that. did the same thing earlier this season. He blasted his team in but public. He's, Said they were no good. But he's blasting them on effort is what it was. With Bayheim, what I hear, it sounds almost like it, it's some form of strategy or whatever it is that they're doing on the court. And, and these are also, too, not professionals. These are college yeah. guys that he's brought in and have had no success at all. Yeah, he's, he's talking fundamentals at press conference yeah. about catching the ball. But I will say that, and Jody probably knows, he's talking to the players when he's at that press conference. He's not talking to the media. I think when he talks, he's in the locker room talking to his players, and I think he's using the media to get to his players. I really think it's, it's – because I saw it for years with yeah. Paterno. He would whine after every game and, and media day, and he would complain about his team constantly, and it was a message to the players rather than the media. Do you, but do you, I don't but, think it's effective. I really well, you don't. Well, you've got to know the makeup of your team. Man. These kids may not be able to handle public criticism. They're not kids. Come on, they're 19 years old. I played junior hockey. Yep. Our coaches yelled at you. That's all part of a coaching. You got to feel the, the yep. buttons. You know, sometimes junior hockey is a lot more professional college <laughs> basketball. I think, though. I disagree. We got thirty dollars a week. <laughs> you know, it was well, a lot. They're getting really off they're on getting your own. Well, you're getting education. The reason they're getting into those schools is to play yeah. basketball. They all want to be pros. And, and let's face it, just like as a parent, you know. You've yeah. got to sometimes pat them on the back. Sometimes you've got to let them know, hey. <laughs> this portion of the Rochester Press Box brought to you by the distillery. Unfinished Business is next. And you don't need to be Native American to realize it is offensive. And it's not politically correct. It's the right thing to do. He was an idiot for throwing him that pitch. The guy's phenomenal. He had no reason yeah. to give him anything, especially a fastball to hit. It's simply that these two guys, Ronaldo and Tom Brady, are too good looking. <laughs> I like it, just don't admit to it. <laughs> Everybody wants to hate on the best in the world. You know, he's here, he's here to stay, and he wants to build something big time. The bottom line is, still nobody's going to like A-Rod. Welcome back to the original Rochester Press Box, Unfinished Business, John. You know, the other day someone asked me who I thought the league MVP was in the NFL. I paused and I said, you know what? It's J.J. Watt of the Houston Texans. And I say this because you look at the quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, not much separates either one. They're both great. I could argue Rodgers, Billy could ar 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 argue Brady. I can make a case for DeMarco Murray of the Dallas Cowboys. I can certainly make a case for Jody's guy, Peyton Manning. But my strongest case is for the guy who is completely unblockable. The Houston Texans are 7-7 seven and seven with garbage at quarterback. The guy has five touchdowns this year. I'm talking about J.J. Watt. He does it on both ends. I haven't seen anyone in a long time who is completely unblockable in football, and his name is J.J. Watt. 118 tackles, double-digit sacks. I don't think anybody in the game today has more of an impact on a game than J.J. Watt, and I'm talking about a defensive player. First time since Lawrence Taylor that we could see an env a defensive player win the MVP. Yeah, and he's recognizable too, which is a great thing. Incredible. Jody. Let me first start off uh, with, uh, we know the holidays are coming, and just from a promotional standpoint, that the, the Amherst are uh, got a great homestand through the holidays. They're playing the 26th, the 27th, the 31st, and the 2nd. And also the Nighthawks have their home opener coming up on uh, January 3rd, raising the banner. I guess the topic I'd like to talk about is uh, kids in sports. I think that uh, 
I encourage parents because they're always coming up to me about uh, you know uh, their kids about scholarships and and whatnot. But uh, my key thing is uh, allow them to be kids, allow them to have fun, and put them in for the right reasons. Sports, I believe, does two main things: it helps them physically and also more importantly mentally. It builds character. It shows them how to win and lose. And all these people out there that say everyone should get a ribbon, I totally disagree. It's not real life. Real life is about out, out there working for bad coaches, good coaches, how to deal with adversity. And uh, go online and look up how many great hockey players have played other sports like lacrosse and baseball. I know with my dad, he made me play many sports. I played hockey, baseball, uh, football, basketball, track, wrestling, cross country, chess club even. <laughs> and so they can even do other things, not just sports. But if, uh, allow them to be kids and ask for scholarships. If you're worried about it, save your money and, and pay for their education. All right, Joe, we do a whole show on that. Nicely hey, done. Mike? Chris Conti is a safety for the Chicago Bears. He's 25 years old. He suffered a series of injuries, and he's not the most popular guy on the Bears because he tends to make some mistakes in the game. He was on a radio interview this week, and he talked about playing the game with injuries and all the things that come with being a football player. And he actually said it would not be a problem for him to have his life shortened by 10, 15 years at the end of his life because he got to do what he wanted, which was to play football. It meant that much to him to be in the NFL, no matter all the cost, physically and mentally, that go with it. And it's kind of sad, but also revealing the mindset a lot of these football players have and why I feel for a lot of these guys later in life. I think sometimes when you hear a 25-year-old guy say the one goal he has in life is to outlive his parents so that they don't have to see him die young, but he also says at the same time it was worth it to him to play in the NFL. It's both, I guess, in one way impressive that a guy would be so dedicated, but sad in another way that it meant that much to him he's willing to sacrifice so much. So think about that when you see these guys out there on the field, not just what they've given up in their lives to play, but the mindset they take into playing what can be a brutal game, both short-term and long-term. Nicely done. Thank you, guys. We'd also like to thank our sponsors at the distillery. We can pick up halftime appetizers every night after 9 o'clock from Sunday through Thursday. Nice job, John. As really? always, thank you. Good Michael, stuff. Thanks. thank you. Jody, it was a pleasure having yeah. you in, man. It was a pleasure being here. All righty. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week in the original Rochester Press Box. <laughs>